Cities should grow their own food. Now, when you hear somebody say something like that, it's only natural to wonder about the practicalities. After all, isn't city land too expensive for farming? Wouldn't city-grown food be subject to all that pollution from the city? And wouldn't all those urban farms make the city too spread out and inconvenient to get around in? Well, not to worry. As a former market gardener, urban eco-village co-founder, lifelong car-free urbanist, and twice-certified permaculture designer, I've got you covered. Today's episode will address all of these questions and reveal eight surprising benefits of urban agriculture. Welcome to Edenicity. Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. Now, a slight disclaimer here. When I talk about urban agriculture, I'm not talking about just importing industrial farms into the city. That, of course, would be crazy. In fact, there's been some recent publicity about vertical farming, which people were hoping to do in the city, running into serious financial problems. No, what I'm talking about is urban farming Edenicity style. And to understand that, we need to go back to the purpose of Edenicity, which is to end the mass extinction by reducing urban sprawl. The method that we use is ecological logically informed design that brings together housing, energy, transportation, and food systems to work synergistically with one another, so that the whole is much more than the sum of the parts. This involves stacking functions, such that everything in the system provides multiple functions, using tight loops to recover resources, such as compost and water. Applying the principle of polyculture, where we have diverse layered crops that provide multiple, slightly lesser yields on the same plot of land that add up again to much more than you would have had with monocrop, one at a time agriculture. And finally, for Edenicity, I envision a very tight integration between the urban farms, grocery stores, and cafes, so that these are basically one organization that can plan and market their wares together. So that region by region, town by town, village by village, maybe even block by block, a single organization can plan meals, market offerings, planting harvests, and regeneration. The components of the Edenicity food system would not be built all at once. These would be phased in with lots of analysis and adjustment along the way. And the basic sequence would be rooftop and kitchen gardens. And by kitchen gardens, I don't mean gardens in the kitchen, of course, but rather gardens that would offer herbs, greens, and fresh veggies within a few footsteps of the personal or restaurant kitchens within a housing block. The blocks themselves would have orchards that would provide tree and pond crops, depending on climate. At somewhat larger scale, villages composed of many blocks would maintain their own broadacre crops. These would be your grains and beans, as well as animal grazing. This is where you would find cows and chickens and other farm animals. And finally, at the town level, we would have forests providing timber and forage. The interplay between these different scales and land uses is based on permaculture, which is, simply put, applied ecology. It's ecologically functional, labor-saving, and aesthetically pleasing to make as much productive green space accessible to people close to where they live as possible. Okay, with that background, I think we're ready to dive into the eight benefits. But before we do, just in case we get disconnected, please be sure you're subscribed so you don't miss more deep dives like this. And while you're there, consider leaving a like. It helps the channel quite a bit. Thank you very much. The first benefit of urban agriculture is better land use. This is the big issue that I think most people would have with urban agriculture. Urban lots can cost hundreds of times more per hectare than rural lots. So why on earth would anyone use them for agricultural purposes? Well, as it turns out, we already use a lot of urban space for not only low-value purposes, but highly destructive purposes. Let me illustrate with a couple of slides from a conference presentation that I made a couple of years back. If you look at the value of residential streets serving neighborhoods, the land area that streets occupy can add up to anywhere from $14,000 per residence in Shelby, Tennessee, to $284,000 per residence in Santa Clara, California. This street here is in San Jose. Now, various studies of land use in cities will say that the space used by streets is somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the surface area of the city. But that only accounts for streets and parking. So much of a city's design is a response to cars. For example, on this unusually narrow street for the U.S., the street is only 30 feet wide. But when you add the green strip between the street and the sidewalk, that increases the area dedicated to car infrastructure infrastructure by another 60%. We're not even close to done, because if you look at this picture, the houses are all set back much farther from the street than the width of the green strip and the sidewalk. All told, the streets, the parking, the car infrastructure, and the setbacks and lawns, which are all responses to cars, add up to as much as 80% of the surface area of a city. In addition to that, if we go from single-family housing to multifamily housing, we can save quite a bit more land, as I've illustrated in this 
this episode here. And this works even with relatively low-rise architecture. For example, several other YouTube urbanism channels have recently pointed out that Paris, France, has a higher residential density than New York City, meaning more people per square kilometer. You might wonder, well, how is that possible? New York City has all those high-rises. Well, New York City has both high-rises and single-family homes with yards, and that single-family architecture just takes up enormous amounts of space and vastly reduces its density. Paris, meanwhile, is much more low-rise, but much more consistently multifamily in its architecture. All of which is to say that large areas of cities are being used in offhand ways without much regard to value. Now, even if you agree with that, you might look at it from a sunk cost perspective and say, well, look, we already have streets, and it would be a real shame and a real waste to tear them up and turn them into farms. But the fact is, streets are constantly being maintained or replaced. I once lived on a street that was resurfaced twice in eight years. In a relatively short order, most streets undergo some degree of renewal and are fair game when it comes to finding other uses for that space. As for the issue of whether urban farms would spread things out too much, first of all, as we saw with the Edenicity design, we're layering the crops, we're getting significantly higher yields per acre, and we're getting dual use out of the landscaping around and on top of our buildings. But in addition to that, there are many ways to cluster blocks, villages, towns, and regions so that they have easy access to the farm areas but are still tightly clustered. Edenicity is one approach where we have very tight villages arranged in towns which are then arranged in regions within a city, but there's other approaches as well. For example, in his book Car Free Cities, J.H. Crawford has a, a great number of designs, including this one here, where the white areas basically would all be green space. And here's an Edenized version of his design. I'll do an episode on this at some point if people are interested. Anyway, farming is a much better use of land than dangerous, polluting traffic. And there's lots of room in cities to find those uses. The second benefit of urban farming is cleaner food. Now, one of my permaculture instructors, Jeff Lawton, has made the case that if you live in a city, you're already exposed to all of the pollutants anyway, and the urban farming would not significantly increase your exposure. But I think with total city design, we can do quite a lot better than that. But our first step is to realize that poisoning from foodborne chemicals is common and is not strictly an urban problem. For example, when I was in high school, I started noticing that I was getting headaches after lunch, and so were most of my classmates, like right after lunch. And a few weeks later, my parents noticed that I had completely stopped drinking milk. I just couldn't tolerate it at all. I was fine with imported cheese, but milk from the local dairies was just not working for me. Then a few weeks later, the news dropped that all the island milk was contaminated with heptachlor, which was a pesticide that they were spraying on nearby pineapple fields that apparently drifted or wound up somehow in the cattle feed and then in the milk supply for the island. That was basically the end of the dairy industry in Hawaii. From then on, it was imported mainland milk. My second story, unfortunately, involves probably nearly everybody watching this right now, and that is ingestion of glyphosates through conventionally grown grains and legumes. Glyphosate is a broad-spectrum herbicide that is in really intensive use now that there are glyphosate resistant GMO crops. Farmers use it on-label, of course, to suppress weeds, but off-label as well because it has desiccating properties, meaning that it helps dry out some grain crops so that you can harvest them a little bit sooner. According to Zach Bush, MD, glyphosate is also a broad antibiotic that can harm your gut health, causing a wide range of harms in the body. I've linked an interview with him in the comments. Note that both stories did not involve urban farming. We are already exposed to plenty of harmful chemicals and the Edenicity plan for urban farming would be all organic, so we would not be exposed to any of these things. Now, one toxin that is more of a problem in cities is lead. Fortunately, it's fairly easy to deal with. Step one, remove the cars and the car infrastructure, which is responsible for the bulk of lead poisoning even today. And two, test the soil. Removing it if the contamination is extreme, or treating it with biochar, iron filings, or compost, which have all been proven to be effective in reducing the toxicity of lead to manageable levels. Deep Green Permaculture did a great summary article on this. See the link in the description. The third benefit of urban agriculture is more variety and flavor. One of the most shocking bits of news I've read was that between 1903 and 1983, the U.S. lost 93% of its food variety in terms of what was available in seed banks. This is why, in the late 1990s, there was kind of a renaissance of farmer's markets. I think for most people, the experience was probably a tomato. 
I had gotten to the point where I didn't like tomatoes. They seemed bland. They had basically no taste. And of course, these were the supermarket tomatoes that were optimized for easy transport and a really long shelf life. So when I was living in Pasadena in the late 90s, biking around on weekends, I happened across a farmer's market and bought a tomato. And it was the most amazing, tasty thing I could have ever imagined. So I ended up buying all these different varieties of tomato. There were heirloom varieties, big and small. There were the little grape tomatoes. There were the green tomatoes that were meant to be fried up green. It was just heaven. I would make baguette sandwiches with not much more than fried green tomatoes and provolone cheese. It was amazing. Years later, when I became a market gardener, Gardener. I had the pleasure of growing lemon cucumbers. No, they don't taste like lemons, but they do look like them, as well as tromoncino squash, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail later, and fancy greens, including all kinds of lettuce varieties, as well as my favorite, mizuna. I grew fancy potatoes, and rainbow carrots have become a little bit more popular in the years since I grew. Now, what made the farmer's market renaissance possible? Well, basically the fact that you could buy produce that was picked the same day, or at the very earliest the previous night. So it was much fresher and much simpler to transport. Urban farming would multiply this effect manyfold because it would bring the farms right there into the city. On a similar vein, our fourth benefit is that the food would be much fresher. When I attended one of the Oxford Real Farming Conferences, a few of us growers started comparing notes about our customers' comments about how fresh our stuff was. I mentioned that customers were amazed that my lettuce lasted up to three weeks in the fridge, whereas supermarket lettuce at that time was lasting maybe five days in the fridge. And pretty much every Everybody chimed in with their own stories. Everybody had a story of how much their buyers appreciated, how much more durable their produce was. Market growers could also grow unusual varieties like this dromboncino squash, which can last at least six months, if memory serves, maybe the better part of a year, just on the shelf at room temperature and still be quite tasty. What I used to do was grab a squash every few weeks and start cutting it up in sections to use in my squash bread for market. And I would just rubber band a piece of plastic over the cut end and put it in the fridge and it tasted just like zucchini six to eight months after harvest. And finally, urban gardens can offer ultra-perishable produce. Even as a market gardener, I was able to offer people zucchini blossoms, which they would use as an edible garnish that night or batter and fry up for guests. When I harvested snow peas, I would also harvest their blossoms and tendrils, which people used in salads again same day. By bringing the food growing much closer to where people live, we can get much more creative and have a lot more fun with much fresher food. The fifth benefit of urban agriculture is better nutrition. Nutrition experts never seem to agree on anything except that we should eat more greens and veggies and maybe less grain. And having fresh food grown in close to where you live addresses both of those needs. Now, fresher food is also much more nutritious. So food picked and brought to table the same day is much easier to do when it's being grown right there near where you live. And organic food is also much more nutritious. Jeff Lawton used to take his refractometer, which is uh, this device, and look at the index of refraction of the juices of the lettuce he was growing and compare it to the hydroponic lettuce that he could find in a supermarket. What he found was that hydroponic lettuce had a bricks of two, whereas Lawton's lettuce was almost off the scale at 16 to 18 bricks, meaning that it had far more carbohydrates in it, which also correlated with other nutrients. In addition, there are many studies that link organic produce to better disease resistance. I'll put the links in the description. Our sixth benefit is that you can get to know your farmer. Do you know where your food comes from, let alone who grew it? Probably not. If you ask school kids where food comes from, unless they have a food education program in the school, chances are they're going to say something like from the store or from DoorDash. The fact is, in the U.S. and many other countries, we're very out of touch with where our food comes from and who is involved in growing it. In the U.S., 70% of agricultural workers are foreign-born, and 78% live in crowded, substandard housing. Which is ironic, because for farmer's market customers, a farm tour is a special treat. In his book, One Straw Revolution, Masanobu Fukuoka wrote about how, even at the time of writing, in 1978, it was still very common for people in Japan to know their rice farmer. 
Yet somehow with industrialization, we've gotten away from that. Here's an image taken from 2023 of a five hectare, mostly rice farm in Japan. The lady who runs that farm, part of her success, if I understood her correctly, was that she has a farm to table restaurant right by the roadside near her farm. And this gets us to the seventh benefit of urban farming, which is affordability. Now this may seem really crazy because if farm laborers got paid city wages and lived in city housing, wouldn't that drastically increase the price of food? Well, it could if we were just importing industrial farms into the city, which is not our plan. The beauty of farmers markets is that farmers can get retail pricing, not wholesale pricing for their goods. And that one step pricing would also apply to a combined farm to table organization like that slide I just showed you of that farm in Japan. Of course, with proximity, we would gain some innate efficiencies of time, energy, and the ability to recycle wastes directly from the restaurant back into the farm and from the city back into the farm. But I think the case could also be made that subsidized housing should be offered. And we've previously talked about housing affordability and farm workers average nearly $14 an hour in wages. The subsidies that we would be looking at for farm workers today are very comparable to the subsidies that would be involved in overcoming the current market failure of housing in the U.S. But I think we could actually even look at this in a little bit more holistic way. It's likely, for reasons I just outlined, that urban agriculture would focus much more on produce than on grains. Our diets would be higher in fresh produce because it's more available and of higher quality. And so there would be less demand for grain and therefore less demand for grain subsidies. Oh, and I should point out that broad-scale crops would have animals in the loop as well. There would be some animal agriculture available, so carnivores need fret, there could be some meat in their diets if that's how a village, a town, a region wants to structure their agriculture. And with field grazed animals, we have far less demand for bulk grain. And there's far less demand for grain subsidies. So what I propose is as the demand for grain and therefore the subsidies for grain declines, that we subsidize housing a little bit more. The bottom line is that between retail pricing, the innate efficiencies of growing close to where we live, and the shift of housing subsidies, it's very unlikely that prices would be any higher than we have today. And in fact, they may be lower due to consolidation of farming, restaurants, and food markets at the extremely local scale. Our eighth but not yet final benefit is greener cities. Replacing car infrastructure with urban farms would dramatically reduce U.S. trauma from car crashes, if we follow the Edenicity plan, improve air quality, which some studies have indicated could be twice as damaging as car crashes, and dramatically improve water quality because you don't have so much runoff from roads and all that other car infrastructure. These are enormous improvements to safety, health, and productivity. A lot of times people don't understand that productivity angle, so let me really spell that out. I've even had some people say, hey, wait a minute, if we're that much healthier, won't that hurt GDP? Because if people aren't going to the doctor, won't that reduce economic activity? Well, no, actually, it'll have the opposite effect because when people are healthier, they have fewer sick days and therefore they're able to work more, they earn more, and they have more money to spend, and they spend it. So the immediate effect on GDP of moving into an Edenicity neighborhood, which is substantially greener than what we have today, is greater health, greater productivity, greater GDP. Now, if you're curious about the exact statistics behind these improvements to safety and air quality, have a look at this episode here. Okay, since you're still here, there's a bonus. And this one's my favorite. Urban farming will give us a much richer culture. Food is art. Gardens are high art. Chefs, bakers, and even some farmers are becoming celebrities. Farmers markets already bring these creators, their art, and their audiences together. And they also build an understanding and appreciation between people and occupations that might otherwise never have met. Urban farming, especially merged with the dining and shopping experience, can only deepen these trends, enriching city life and city culture. Now, to learn a little bit more about the urban farming debate, have a look at this episode here. The discussion it sparked in the comments was so good, I had to make this follow-on short here about growing your own food. And for an overview of the Edenicity approach to design, have a look at this episode here. Take care, stay green, see you next time.